Thanks for the last presentation. I was interested by the last picture you showed about the um, the ordained tree. It looks like a, a monk had wrapped that rosewood tree in robes. And I wonder if you have any information on if that's been an effective um, way to stop the logging of rosewood trees. Thanks. It, it's definitely been an approach from, um, well, I think the person who did that was one of the rangers um, who brought a, a monk in to do that. And it's definitely one of like the last sort of s approaches um, to dealing with the uh, loggers who come in to cut uh, the rosewoods down. I don't know if it's effective or not because there are multiple cases where rosewood um, loggers have gone into temples to cut down um, rosewood trees so and threatened the monks as well. So I think at the end of the day, um, the value for the rosewood is very high, but it's just an interesting sort of um, approach that people have taken, taken to religion, try to uh, protect the tree. Because it's also in Thailand a very um, spiritual tree. So as I mentioned, uh, Thailand's not a key consumer because of the name. Payung means support. So if you do something bad to the tree, it's, it's associated um, sort of with negative things. So we don't actually uh, have a lot of this furniture and a lot of the wood. So. Yeah, I, it, it doesn't really make a difference, but it does reflect on the culture and the links with the tree. Yeah. Question at the front over there. This is actually a question for all four of you. Um, it's a question about uh, communications on sustainable use. So in a world where there's a growing interest, particularly amongst the West and online, for animal welfare and animal rights, how do we communicate about sustainable use, and particularly institutions who partly depend on donations by the general public? Well, since it's to all four of us, let us quickly run from Holly up the table. Puts me at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably depends on what product you're talking about and the nature of the consumers. So I think one of the talks this morning was talking about profiling users of rhino horn in Vietnam, for example. Um, so I think kind of catch-all communications um, don't necessarily work. I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. I mean, are we trying to reduce demand for shark fin, for example? Um, or are we trying to encourage consumers to um, demand sustainably sourced shark fins. So I think it probably depends on the species and your the objectives of the communication. Michael. I think it depends who you mean by we, but um, I, I, I think it's very important to acknowledge the ethical and welfare issues. And I think particularly when we're talking about large animals and, and sentient beings, um, and not to trivialize those concerns. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that there are other people in other parts of the world who just don't get it. Um, and, and I think what we really need is a dialogue between those groups. Um, at the moment, I feel it's way too polarized. They're not really talking to one another and understanding each other's positions. So. Um, I guess my answer would be more concerned with um, the people living within, so if I use Siamese rosewood as an example, within the protected area and within areas where you can find Siamese rosewood, I don't think it could be sustainably traded just in the, for the number of species, uh, the, the trees left. But I think it would be important to develop tim the timber trade to be more transparent, and that would be an essential um, thing to to do um, in order to pull the attention away from these species that cannot be traded sustainably to things that maybe can possibly be traded sustainably. You, you mentioned uh, welfare and ethical considerations and you mentioned conservation and I'm from the school of thought personally that likes to consider both elements as part of an integrated sort of conservation and not to 
polarise them. But talking of polarity, it seems to me in communication, we must remember that there's some people who are interested in evidence to evaluate their opinions. And yet, in the topics we've been talking about today, it's been my experience that there are some people who are not, that hold what you might call a Kantian view. They know what is right or wrong, and the evidence is immaterial. There's other people who are more in the school of Jeremy Bentham who are looking for the least worst case. And I think realizing that uh, both those types of person exist in our audience is helpful. Question at the back, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Jones from the Born Free Foundation. I'll address my question to Michael, although it perhaps cuts across uh, the, some of what the other speakers have had to say as well. Uh, I was interested in what you said about unintended consequences and your take on the precautionary approach, or perhaps South Africa's take on the precautionary approach with respect to lion bones. Um, but I suppose my question centers around how we try and account for the complexities of market demand. And I'm thinking of things like preferences for wild over farmed products or the substitution of one product for another, and that's pertinent to lines with respect to tiger bone. Um, and I'd like to ask you um, about the danger that by allowing a legal trade in lion bone from captive bred lions, so for instance the trade can be monitored and studied, uh, is there not a huge danger of stimulating some of these unintended consequences, which could have uh, implications for wild lions and other big cats, and that once that sort of gene is out of the bottle, if you like, it's going to be very, very difficult to put it back. Thanks, Mark. I think the important point is the genie is out of the bottle. It has been out for the last decade. And now that we sit with that situation, um, I think the, the question is, well, how do we, how do we intervene? Do we go in and, and we shut it down? We're not, it's not as if South Africa is saying, oh, we're going to start trading in lion bones. We are and have been. The question is, what, where do we go from here? Um, now, the South, South Africa set a relatively modest quota by, by, by the industry standards. The industry wanted three or four times that quota last year, the, the, the amount of 800, simply based on the history that preceded it. But now, now we're going to get data that will tell us a lot more about how that market is evolving. So rather than set a zero quota, put everyone on hold, potentially put some people out of business, potentially drive them to illegal activity, rather draw them in and say, well, let's all work together. We understand your concerns, but please understand ours and let's Let's try and figure something out. I'm very glad you raised the wild, uh, the preference for wild versus farmed issue because this is, this is often raised. That's not a binary issue. Ask anybody if they'd prefer wild caught salmon or farmed salmon, they'll all say I prefer wild caught salmon, but a lot of people buy, in fact I'd argue the majority of people buy farmed salmon. Why? Because it's cheaper. And so when, when understanding the preferences of those two products, we actually have to look at how much people are actually willing to pay. It's very easy for them to say, oh, I prefer the wild product. But we need to understand what that substitutability looks like. Um, and so the, the, these are things that we really need to understand, and we don't. We're, we're sort of groping around in the dark. And, and that, that's why I, I argue here we have a, a unique little window into a world that we haven't closed yet that we can potentially exploit to understand more about these issues. Now, as a question of balance, the ideal would be a question now for Holly, and perfectly it would come from the middle sector of the room. <laughs> Failing that, however... Yes, Tom. Um, with apologies, this is going to um, upset the balance still further, uh, which is, um, this was intended as a question for Michael, but actually applies to all three speakers, and it's the exact opposite of the question we've just had, which is, can you foresee or can you imagine a case in which a demand reduction campaign for the products that we're talking about amongst consumers of those products may lead to unintended cons consequences which negatively affect the uh, species you're working on? Oh, so am I going to take this? Oh. Um, I, I would be interested in answers from all three of you. So. Um, yes. Probably. I'm just trying to think through what might happen in a shark context. Um, so I guess you could, you could do a demand reduction campaign for, for shark fin. 
Um, and so consumers in, in consumer countries, China and Hong Kong, might reduce um, the amount to which they consume it. And therefore, the price falls out of the market. Um, but in Indonesia, you have people who are very tied to their shark fishing. Um, it's very difficult for them to move between industries, actually, because shark fishing requires certain gears, certain boats, certain skills. Um, and people are quite reluctant to change. One of the surveys we did in one of our project sites, um, when we asked people what they would do if, if their profits declined or their catch declined by 50%, they said they'd carry on fishing. So potentially, if the price fell out of the market, shark fishers would be getting less money for their product. And so we'd just fish harder and fish further in order to regain those profits, for example. Michael, would you like a go? Yeah, um, I think there are... Um, Two, two ways I can think of that demand reduction could backfire. The one is if you target a particular product, there might be substitutes for that product that are of other species that are perhaps not as threatened, but if you succeed, then people might switch to other substitutes. That's one example. And another one is that depending on who's driving the demand reduction campaign, who's actually running the campaign, for example, if you've got users of traditional medicines, who then see Westerners driving a campaign, they might be somewhat cynical and think, oh, well, those are pharmaceutical companies trying to peddle their products and they're different or their culture or whatever. And they, they might actually, you might actually be, see a defiant response to that. And I wouldn't be surprised if that has, in fact, uh, happened in some instances. Entire. Um, I think that a demand reduction campaign, I think it would be good for the species, but I wouldn't be able to say what effect that would have on uh, other species because the growth or the boom of Siamese rosewood happened uh, very surprisingly. It was like surprisingly after the Beijing Olympics where the demand just increased for this specific type of furniture as well, like an intricately carved, I, I think Qing dynasty uh, type style furniture. So it's very culturally linked and you would have to look into a lot the different factors which explains or looks into why people are purchasing this because it's not small either. A lot of the furniture are big, like large size and it's a commitment to buy. So you would have to look into how they will direct um, their energy and their money instead and where it will go instead. Very good. Next question. Somebody? Very good. Yes, lady there. And after your question, I'll turn to Michael for two minutes reflection on commonalities from the session. Please. Thanks. This is just for the talk regarding Rosewood. I was just curious within your study area if you knew about any efforts um, to engage uh, timber companies, furniture makers, um, I don't know if it's all pretty underground, but um, engage those stakeholders uh, uh, regarding use of certified wood or just to boost accountability in, in that stakeholder group uh, rather than just enforcement or you know on the ground if you knew any efforts about that to en engage those stakeholders um, I think China as a consumer country has tried to increase um, their their scrutiny in the imports of the timber seas so they now they want it's important to have the full scientific name and it's important um, to know exactly, uh, to know where the wood is coming from. But the problem with this region is that um, the rosewood trade, the rosewood trade is along every step, it's very corrupt. And so it's very difficult to, um, to certify or uh, inc like to, to have transparency or to actually believe that your timber is from Lao because um, previous reporting has already shown that you can just make up the documents, you can buy the documents, and it's very easy. Of course, um, companies try to uh, increase this transparency and they try to increase the certification, but it's, it's difficult considering um, just the, nature, the region and just how um, it operates, I think. Very good. Michael. Okay, the maximum of two minutes, please. Okay, so the, the, over, the overriding theme of this uh, symposium is evolving perspectives on demand, but these sessions have really been about linking supply with demand. And I think what we, uh, what we all pointed out is that in each case, um, 
a top-down approach, a CITES approach that simply tries to regulate from above is not going to work without local participation and support. We've, in, each, in each case, we've had examples of industry participants, we've had examples of corruptions, industry participants being involved, not, not even potentially knowing about the regulations or resisting the regulations, and so the, the solutions have to involve people at the, at the other end of the supply chain as well. Very good. Yeah. And Penta, I'll turn to you later. Um, the back of the room, I don't want you to be disadvantaged by being a long way away. Are there any hands waving up there? Yes, there's a hand waving. Uh, so with the rosewoods, the Dalbergia being blanketed on CITES so that every species, and you were saying with some sharks that um, some of the genus have just been put on CITES instead of the species specifics. Do you think that causes an issue when something is very common and then that can't be traded in, as opposed to like something that is actually really, really threatened and really uncommon? Do you think that raises, causes a risk to focus on certain species or not? It's any sense. Do you want to have a go? <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, uh, mm. Just, just encapsulate the question again, because we're, we're composing our answers down here. <laughs> okay, so I work, I'm working on red listing CITES timbers, and I know that the Dalbergia, like the whole genus has been listed, and there's a lot in Central America that are very, very common, and they could be traded effectively in sustain, well, not sustainably, because they take so long to grow, but like their numbers are good, and I think, and there's a worry that if um, you're, blanket protecting everything, the stuff that is okay to trade. Like it doesn't matter if they're like poaching the other stuff because it isn't being specified anyway. So do you think that causes any issues? Um, if should it be, so, so should CITES be more species specific as opposed to genus? I, I think so, I think, but the issue is that is that it's hard to be specific to every single case and every single situation. Like right now, um, I think the issue with the listing is that the Petrocarpus macrocarpus, the Paduk, isn't listed. And it's one of the few ones that are not listed yet within the, in the region. So um, in this context, it would be good to have a general ban for s targeted species, species that we know are involved in the trade. That are commonly traded. Um, but I think that would require further information to understand sort of uh, the distribution and how many trees are actually left, which in this region, we, I don't think we've had a good estimate for the past five, 10 years. So right now it is a good option to have. It is a safer option to have to regulate the trade. But if there's more information in other contexts, in like more specific information that the trade is okay, it's not, it's not threatening the species, then I think the blanket ban wouldn't really be useful. Very good. And just before I turn to Pentai for two minutes of reflection on all the talks, uh, thinking of your question there about the tyranny of words, we did a bit of work recently looking at the way that the law for protection in China has not caught up with changes in the taxonomy and the names given to species internationally. I think it's a different but similar point to the one you were driving at, is that by changing the name of something, you can change its distribution and therefore change its legal status in a way that can work out badly. Um, anyway, Pentai, do you have any uh, reflections on the whole session? Um, well, I've definitely seen a lot of commonalities between all the talks, and especially Holly's, where you talk about the effectiveness of CITES listings and if it is actually effective. Um, I think that a lot of the regional laws and domestic laws, in the example of Thailand, is still not very clear at all. So if we can't get this first stage right, then it's a bit of a reach to, to implement international regulations. So I think it would be, it, it highlights or shifts the spotlight onto the, the core problem, the problems within the country, the problems uh, with the people involved and how they perceive the law and the domestic legislation. And that needs to be addressed. Um, and it's also very important as well. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? 
I was just going to add to um, the previous question. Please. About, because you did ask about sharks as well, right? So I'm going to just jump in. So I think, I think your question, if I'm totally clear, was um, should, species, should, should CITES be more species specific? And are there any issues with having whole genre <laughs> listed on CITES? Um, I think in the case of sharks and rays, um, a more species specific approach is, is probably in many ways more problematic. Like species specific approach is very, very difficult um, in terms of actually having any impact at the, at the fishing mortality level because fishermen can't pick and choose which species they catch. And actually listing whole genre kind of makes um, people's lives easier within the supply countries because um, it kind of reduces the morphological similarity issues. Um, and so it, it means that monitoring is actually a little bit easier. Trade monitoring is a little bit easier. Um, so I would say it probably really depends on the sort of context of the species and how it's exploited. But I would think, and it's maybe applicable for other species as well, that if the whole genre is listed, it just makes the country's lives a bit easier because you reduce some of these similarity issues potentially. Liz, did I see you waving? Um, for chain of custody for the lions, um, uh, broadly, South Africa may be able to control uh, its trade, but how does the trade chain have stop chain of custody from lion bones coming in from elsewhere, where we know they are being poached for trade? And so you've got that chain of custody issue. And then for the sharks, really, ideally, you'd have your chain of custody before they chop off the head and the fin so that you can then track it through. But that may be completely impractical. So I was just thinking with both of these, if we're going to have a sustainable trade in any way, we've got to have some way to control that chain of custody. And I don't know how to do it, and I wondered if you had any views on that. <laughs> Holly, do you like to go first? Oh, go on then. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we need to be able to monitor from the point of exploitation. Currently, that's just incredibly hard to implement in Indonesia. It's such a huge country. There's such a long coastline. There's so many fisheries. And it's something like 95% of fishers in Indonesia class to small scale fisheries. Um, and there's shark fisheries sort of scattered across, you know, you can probably look at a map of Indonesia and stick your finger somewhere and there's probably somebody there catching sharks in one way or another. Um, it's not a very kind of clear cut industry in terms of these people here are catching sharks and these people aren't. So in terms of actually monitoring at the catch level, that's just kind of an overwhelmingly big challenge and I don't know how we deal with that. Um, you know, okay, let's say everybody has to have um, VMS tracking systems or you put cameras on all of the boats, but that's so many boats and then so much manpower required to then actually look through all, all of those videos such that, you know, the detection of who's catching what species is going to be really small. So at, at the moment, the Indonesian government has a, a bunch of offices dotted throughout the country where if any shark product is going to be transported through the country or exported, it has to go through these offices. Um, but there's only six of them. And people are required to say, oh, this shark came from here. And then the office check what product it is um, and say, yes, this is legal or not. But often by the time it gets to that point, it's already been like chopped up at sea. Um, because sometimes the shark fishers, or let's say it's like a tuna fishery, but they catch sharks incidentally. The sharks are for the crew, so they might, or the fins are for the crew, so they chop off the fin. And so there's lots of stuff going on out at sea as well. Um, and I just don't know how practically we would manage that in a country as big and diverse as Indonesia. It's a, it's a big question. If anyone's got any ideas, I would love to hear them. <laughs> Michael, would you like a go? Yes, yeah. So, um, in broad terms, there's an, uh, the, the chain of custody issue for lion bones isn't different from any other uh, CITES Appendix 2 listed species. What's interesting in this particular instance is that after the, um, the quota agreement, the um, previously competing lion bone traders in South Africa actually met and formed a cartel to agree on how to split the quota. Um, so they, they, they've agreed, and they've also agreed to protect their industry. They're obviously worried about losing this business, and they've they, they therefore also agreed to cooperate with the South African government. But they now have an incentive to defend their quota and ensure that nobody else 
leaks um, bones into the system. So we, what, we're, what we're hoping, what we're expecting is there'll be full cooperation on the South African side. Of course, what happens on the, on the importing country side is another story, but at least in this instance, there is only one exporting country, that's South Africa. So it's a fairly simple case to, to, to match up the import and export permits. That doesn't mean that illegal trade can't happen. Illegal trade can, can always happen, of course, for any, any species. But I think in this particular instance, the, the opportunities for laundering are fairly limited because you've got a single exporting <coughs> country. You've now got a cartel of breeders who are working together. So the outlook is better than it might be for a lot of other cases. Yeah. Very good. Well, before we close, I wonder if I could turn finally to Holly for her reflections on lessons learned and generalities. So I think this is probably building on the previous question. It seems to me that sort of traceability is one of the key things that's come up in all of these cases. Um, and the ability of different countries for different species to be able to have um, chain of custody. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and to ensure that um, species are legal and sustainable. Um, and that seems to be an issue throughout many of uh, different wildlife trade um, species and countries. And I don't know how we solve that at the moment um, without some kind of dramatic innovations in terms of species identification, genetic testing, and low cost methods. Very good, thank you. Well, uh, one important thing that I'm asked to tell you uh, is that lunch is in the main dining room. That's the gist of the message, wasn't it? Out that door. Very good. And even more important than lunch, hard to believe though it may be, is thanking all three speakers for their tremendous presentations and thanking you all for joining in the discussion. Let's applaud them.